intelligencesquared.com. Well, you've had two speakers to persuade you, for and against. Let's hear from our second speaker for the motion that democracy is India's Achilles heel. Patrick French is another award-winning writer and historian. His most recent book is India, a Portrait, an intimate portrait of 1.2 billion people, he says. Patrick. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story. At the last general election, I found myself in uh, Kanpur, which to some people here will still be known as Kornpur. And I wanted to see Mukta Ansari, who was a senior aspiring politician. And the place that I had to go and meet him was in Kanpur District Jail. And inside the jail, he'd managed to build himself a basketball court, and he had Harrod's soap in the bathroom. Now, the criminalization of elements of Indian democracy, a problem that has gotten much worse in the last 10 or 20 years, is not something we can ignore. Fortunately, William even referred to this earlier when he was speaking. But let me give a few more examples of the kind of MPs that are ruling India today in the name of democracy. People who are charged with three cases of murder, 10 cases of attempted murder, house trespass causing hurt and mischief. You might say that every MP is probably guilty of mischief. Kidnapping with intent to murder, attempt to murder, wrongful confinement, causing hurt by means of poison, decoity with intent to cause death, and so on. This is not something that is incidental. This is to do with the fact that in large parts of central and northern India, if you are a crime boss, you need representation in the state assembly with the MLAs, and you need it in the center in the Lok Sabha uh, with the MPs, and you make every effort to take over democracy. And that is what has happened to a large extent. There's a different but associated problem, which is extreme corruption. Many of you will have seen the photographs of the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Mayawati, being garlanded with thousand rupee notes, which are kind of so enormous, it's like a giant anaconda of banknotes is being put around her. You will have heard of figures like Jagan Reddy in Andhra Pradesh, whose father died a year or two ago, and who amazingly, in the short time that his father was running that state, managed to go from, let's not say zero, but to a situation now where he has an annual income of 65 million pounds, where he was discovered by the CBI only a few months ago, living in a 75-room palace which he had just built for himself. Now, this problem of corruption is not something that is only comical for the people at the top of the pile. It also extends right down to the roots of Indian society. We had only a few days ago a truck driver in UP in Uttar Pradesh being shot by the police after he failed to produce a 5,000 rupee bribe. And there's a further third association. There's criminalization, there's corruption, and crucially, there is nepotism. When I was researching my most recent book, I did a survey of how every one of India's 545 MPs had got into parliament. And one of the most shocking things was that the incidence of nepotism has grown and grown and grown. If you, do, if you plot a graph between heredity and age, and you look at MPs over the age of 80, you'll find that 0%, none of them, got there because their mummy or their daddy was the previous MP in that seat. But if you look at MPs under the age of 30, 100% of them are there, not because of their personal ability or talent, but purely because of who their parents are. And there is a direct straight line correlating between these two things. This is a problem which has become much worse since the 2004 and 2009 elections. If you look at the Congress party, Mani's party, you will find that of MPs under the age of 40, nine out of 10 are the sons and daughters of eminent politicians. You have effectively had a suborning and a corrupting of the process of democracy in India. Now, we're not arguing on our side of the house that democracy in itself is a flawed way of governing a country. It is the best way of governing a country. What we are arguing is that democracy as it is practiced in India today is a potentially 
fatal weakness. It is an Achilles heel. You cannot simply ignore the scale of that problem. You can't purely talk in theory about democracy and say it's a good thing if it is not implemented in a way that means anything for the mass of the Indian public. We have a situation today in India where democracy is exclusively the preserve of the middle class and the rich. If you are outside certain charmed circles in each Indian state, democracy brings you very few practical benefits. And what I believe needs to happen now is that you need to have accountable government, something that is plainly lacking in large parts of the country. You need to have the rule of law, which is clearly lacking in places where the police can simply shoot somebody and get away with it. And above all, you need to have a functioning state. And that ideally what you want is to go back, not to systems of autocracy, of the variety of, of the different kinds that you had before 1947, but instead to go back to the founding figures of independent India. If you read the Constitutional Assembly debates of the late 1940s, they are deeply inspirational documents. If you read the Indian Constitution, which was promulgated in 1950, it is an incredible, inspiring document. And if you look at the vision, the idea that is contained in those documents and in the speeches of people like Pandit Nehru or Dr. B. R. Ambedkar or uh, Rajendra Prasad or the other people who are taking that part in that process. And let's remember that in that constituent assembly in the late 1940s, there were people who, for example, had been laboring on a dam project they weren't the sons and the daughters, the super-rich sons and the daughters of earlier generations of politicians. They were people who had got there on individual talent and merit. So I believe what needs to happen now is to return to that inspiring vision of the founding mothers and fathers of the Indian nation, which gave rise to democracy in 1947, and to sweep away the corrupt damaged form of democracy that has spread in the course of the last 10 or 20 years. You had a situation in the 1940s in India and in the 1950s when the first general election took place, when suddenly here was a very large illiterate population managing to uh, elect its own leaders in a way that, for example, uh, Winston Churchill, when he was prime minister, thought was completely impractical, uh, if not impossible. You have a situation, you had a situation at that time where the Indian model of democracy was inspiring people right across the world. Across Asia and Africa, in the wake of decolonization, people looked to India's example. Well, today that process has stopped. When people look across to Indian politicians now, they see people who are often criminal, often corrupt, and often the product of nepotism. And even, as Suhel Seit alluded to earlier, you even get some people who get voted out of power and then pop up a few minutes later in the other house, having been put there, in this case, by the Congress party. So what I'm calling for, what we are calling for, is a recognition that democracy as it is practiced in India today is a potentially fatal weakness, an Achilles heel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, William and Mani, your chance to grill Patrick. I still think you're trying to have your cake and eat it here. You can't say that democracy is a fatal weakness and it's also the most inspiring thing about India. The reality is that if you're in Pakistan uh, at the time of Musharraf, if you're Aung San Suu Kyi sitting in, in Rangoon uh, struggling uh, to keep a party alive in a, in a tyranny, uh, in one of the most brutal tyrannies, you do indeed look to India as inspiration. For all its flaws, India is still a beacon to the entire region. I was in Nepal, ten uh, who sadly couldn't make it. Um, but uh, the, the Nepalis look to India in every way as a beacon. For all the corruption, for all the flaws, India is a beacon to the entire region. Sri Lanka, Nepal, the whole of the Sark region look to India. It, and it is because of the democracy. Well, I'm interested to hear that Pakistanis look at uh, India in that very optimistic way that you're They're suggesting. deeply envious for all the, for all the competitiveness. Any there, Pakistanis there, there. in the audience? <laughs> um, well, uh, maybe some of them are looking across in the, in the way that you're suggesting. I think really that what you're suggesting is that 
democracy is some kind of vague, what if, theoretical, abstract concept, something that's purely uh, existing on paper or in people's heads. The issue is democracy as it is practiced. There are all sorts of dictatorships that have pretended they are democracies. There are all sorts of uh, martial law administrators in neighboring countries who said that they are being uh, democratic by, for example, choosing a thousand people and saying these thousand people will then decide what policy is going to be. Uh, you even have elections or had elections in the Soviet Union which supposedly were democratic. The issue is not the abstract concept, it is how is democracy practiced. And I believe that democracy has gone wrong in India in the last 10 or 20 years. And the evidence for that is the growth of criminalization, the growth, the growth of corruption, but most of all, this takeover by nepotistic dynastic politicians. I mean, if you imagine in this room today, imagine if... Uh, all of the people in the whole hall, bar, you know, maybe two dozen on that side, had got there effectively by inheritance rather than by being chosen through internal party democracy. That's the problem with the way things are working now. Money. Uh, I'm going to refute him, so I think I won't ask him any questions. <laughs> I'm going to demolish him when my turn comes. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on the demolition. <laughs>